Well, welcome to Point Taken. I'm Carlos Watson. I'm the host of PBS's new late night show. Um, I hope many of you got to see our first season. In fact, we just wrapped it on Tuesday. It's PBS's first new late night show in almost a dozen years, uh, Tuesday nights at 11. Uh, it's produced by WGBH, which is the pioneering PBS station uh, in Boston, which brings you many of the good things uh, that you enjoy. Um, one of the very first things that we do um, at Point Taken uh, with each show is instead of just having a wonderful debate uh, between a thoughtful guest, we actually ask the audience to participate. And so we're gonna do that again today and we are gonna introduce you to our topic and then ask you how many of you have a uh, cell phone or some kind of mobile device uh, on you. I'm gonna include a laptop. Laptop is fair game. Okay, so everyone who has that is, is enfranchised and is gonna have a chance uh, to participate. So um, our question uh, today, can college sex be managed by a checklist that is affirmative consent, where yes means yes, the agreement to begin or continue an encounter is mutual and clear at each step. So do you think that college sex can be managed this way in which upfront, clearly, uh, people consent and consent in an affirmative way? Um, I want you to go to sift.ly, so S-I-F-T dot L-Y, and cast your vote now. And then after the debate, uh, we're, so we're gonna tally your votes now, and then after the debate, we're gonna give you a second chance to vote. So there's a little bit of Florida in here, uh, re-voting, uh, for those of you who remember 2000. Um, um, oh, so the numbers are moving already. Okay, I like that. A little movement, good, okay. Give you about 30 more seconds to do that. Now, while you guys are doing that, I am going to uh, invite up uh, my colleague and good friend, John Bredard, who's the Vice President of National Programming at WGBH, and who, along with our colleague, Denise Diani, is the creator of this absolutely wonderful program. So, John, let me Thank hand you, over Carlos. To you. Yeah. Thank you, and welcome to the, to, to the panel. Uh, welcome to all of you. Good evening. Uh, at GBH, we produce about 40% of all the primetime programs on PBS. Those are shows like Frontline, Nova, uh, American Experience, Masterpiece, and more. We created Point Taken because we felt there was a void in the TV landscape for reasoned, respectful, informed debate about really important issues. And we wanted to create a format that would reach a broad audience but at the same time, uh, give that audience an opportunity to talk to us and to each other, actually during the program. We also wanted to uh, draw younger and more diverse viewers to public television. And in the first season, we really focused on booking panel, uh, our panels with fresh faces. These are voices that you wouldn't normally hear on television. We like to say our panelists are the smartest people you've never heard of, um, although obviously <laughs> you've heard of these people. Um, our, uh, our first, uh, there, there's also a really rich social media component to point take and that allows an audience to engage and participate in the dialogue and that's something that hopefully you're gonna be able to do this evening. Um, our first season, as Carlos just mentioned, we just wrapped it last Tuesday. Um, we actually had more success than we expected. Uh, our audience skewed far younger than the typical PBS audience. It was far more diverse than the typical PBS audience. And a significant percentage of that audience, over 25% at times, were new to PBS. And that's a really big win for us and I think for the idea of civil dialogue. So now, an Aspen Ideas version of Point Taken for you. And even though it's not a broadcast program, we are gonna stick pretty close to our normal uh, show format. Plus, we are streaming everything live on Facebook. And what that means is that thousands of people around the country are gonna be watching and voting right alongside you guys. Uh, so we're very excited about tonight, but we're especially excited about our upcoming second season. We can talk more about that afterwards. But meanwhile, let's just go back to Carlos. Thank you very much. Thank you. So you guys, I'm going to welcome in our Facebook family. Uh, thousands, hopefully tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people <laughs> will watch us on Facebook Live. 
I'm Carlos Watson. Welcome to Point Taken. Point Taken at the Aspen Ideas Festival. Uh, we want to thank Walter and Kitty for letting us be a part of this uh, very special edition. As many of you know who watch us regularly, we just wrapped our first season on Tuesday, but we were having such a good time we decided to do it more and do it, in fact, in Aspen, Colorado at the Ideas Festival. Uh, so we all know that college and sex uh, often goes together, uh, sometimes really well, and it's great. Unfortunately, at other times, not quite so well. In fact, we recently all have been horrified by uh, what seems to be an epidemic of assault on college campuses, sexual assault in particular, and the Stanford case involving a former swimmer, Brock Turner, brought it all into sharp relief for many. Now, a number of college presidents have tried to look for ways to fix this, look for ways to move things forward to a different place. One of the ideas has been called affirmative consent, the idea that both participants in a sexual encounter affirmatively, clearly uh, state that this is what I want to do and that it's willing and consensual and clear. And the question for some is, can this idea of affirmative consent be one, if not the main way, to start to stem uh, the epidemic of sexual assaults on campus. Now, we want all of you uh, in our Facebook family to join in. Uh, hit us up on Twitter if you like, hashtag point taken PBS. Or uh, if you just want to stick with Facebook, we want you to vote. Um, we want you to go to siftsift.ly and do what our studio audience here has done, which is vote on the question, do you think affirmative consent is an effective way to start to stem the tide of um, college sexual assaults? Um, all right, let's get into the conversation with four really good people. I'm going to start with Team Yes. Uh, we decided to bring a couple of college presidents out uh, to help us with this. Um, Dr. Diane Harrison is president of uh, uh, CSU, Cal State Northridge, uh, down close to Los Angeles, over 41,000 students, the largest uh, CSU in the system. Uh, Sean Decatur is a chemist by training, uh, like me, a Cleveland native who's come back uh, to Ohio not just to root for the Cavaliers, but to lead <laughs> Kenyon College. And um, I want to ask you two to kick us off. Uh, give me your top three points in 30 seconds or so on why you think affirmative consent is not only a good idea, but, but a fundamental positive game changer in this uh, war against sexual assault on college campuses. Well, thank you, Carlos. And I, you know, we'd like to start with the first point that you know, for us, affirmative consent isn't about uh, micromanaging individual sexual encounters or sexual relationships, uh, but rather it's about orienting students uh, towards a positive understanding of sexuality, a positive understanding of sexual relationships in a very healthy and respectful way, something that's increasingly important uh, as young people are confused about. Uh, what it means to be in a healthy sexual relationship. And so that, that notion of, of orienting students is important. We think it also can foster healthier sexual relationships and, and potentially even more, more gender equitable relationships by fostering communication and dialogue. And another reason that we want to stress is that we think it reduces ambiguity. There's a lot of ambiguity among students about all of this. Uh, their sexual relationships, particularly among freshmen who are younger. And so anything that we can do to help reduce some of that ambiguity we think is a good thing. Okay, Team Yes, thank you. We're uh, going to put it on pause for a second go over here to Team No. Uh, we've got Leah Fessler, who may be the closest to this topic, having recently graduated from Middlebury and having written on this topic uh, quite a bit and thought about it uh, a fair amount. And Nancy Gertner, who's been uh, thinking about this uh, a bit too, um, both originally as a uh, lawyer uh, representing various clients and then later as a federal judge and right. more recently as a professor at Harvard Law School. So welcome uh, to both of you. Leah and Nancy, uh, give me your top three points in 30 seconds. Who's going to give that to me? I'll start, and then Leah will finish. Clearly, this is, uh, it's great to reorient the cultural conversation, the, the conversation in the world at large that requires uh, voluntary acts, requires that sex be a voluntary act. But once it is embodied in a legal rule, that's where the problem goes. And so many of these standards talk about voluntary acts, uh, conveyed by word, right? But who says yes in the midst of a sexual encounter? How do you enforce that? So other versions of affirmative con consent say word and deed. Well, deed is already getting into all the ambiguities of, of sexual encounters. It doesn't get at the real heart of the matter, as Leah will describe. 
and it is certainly not a standard that should be implemented on the criminal side, where essentially it reverses the burden of proof, makes it very easy to convict. So it's a good cultural discussion. It's a good political discussion. I have problem with it being implemented. And I do think that if it is implemented, college campuses will be regulating sex. Now, Leah, you guys used up your 30, but because I like yeah, I'm you, sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm, because I like you, because you're working with the judge, I'm going to give you a little more time. What else? What else do you have to say? Nobody ever kept me in time. Uh, right. <laughs> you just took that. Uh, uh. Um, so I want to say that I think I'm in agreement with what you're saying. Though, if the question with what Team Yes is saying, though, if the question is will affirmative consent manage sex on campus, I believe we ought to address not only orient students to, but aggressively address the myriad cultural impacts that are not only driving you know, gender dynamics and um, male dominance to the extent that women must assert yes, but also sexual norms, alcohol norms, cultural norms on college at large that are, in my opinion, the aggressive root of a lot of the behavior that's happening. So, so Diane, Sean, let me, let me come to you having heard this. If, if a cynic if, uh, turned to you and said, affirmative consent sounds like a good idea, but the truth of the matter is you know young kids hopped up on alcohol, uh, lots of hormones, 18, 19 years old. That's the last thing that's going to happen, and so this isn't a real solution. This is a Band-Aid. What do you say when you inevitably hear that kind of critique? I would say that in California, it is state law, so that is what we have to follow. I would say that just like when we uh, try to educate students about drinking and driving, it's taken years for us to change that culture, but we have to do it. I think we're starting. This is a first step, I believe, and I agree the legal ambiguities are there, but uh, what I tell students in the yes is not the absence of no. And, and that's where they get confused. So to me, it's, it's just a first step. It's, it's not a silver bullet. Sean, what do you say when uh, Leah points out there may be some deeper cultural questions? And at the heart of that, maybe you and I and a lot of other guys we know, uh, uh, that there may be an imbalanced system and that really there's as much of an issue around men and young men and power dynamics and that that's a conversation that's even more fundamental than the conversation about are we hooking up consensually or not. And actually, I agree completely that there's some real issues about how uh, gender roles and gender dynamics play out uh, in, a, in a wide range of social settings, but certainly on college campuses. Uh, I think there's some uh, real challenges we have to address uh, real toxic cultures of masculinity that can exist on campuses, uh, and how do we uh, reorient that culture and begin to take apart that culture, and that those are some of the root issues there. Um, at the same time, uh, you know, I agree with Diane that uh, you know, clear rules on consent are far from a magic bullet in any of this, uh, but I also think that clear rules and understanding of consent are an important place to get some of the conversation started because that is, you know, we have students coming in who are very, I think, both uninformed and unclear uh, about what consent means. Uh, and that if we don't actually give some clear terms to be able to have that conversation, uh, then you know, that's an important piece of the overall picture that we'll be missing. Now, Nancy, you, you sit in an interesting position because early in your career, you were a lawyer pushing universities to take more action, take more responsibility to make campuses safer for women. But you said you've also seen the flip side of it, which is, and which leads you to be worried about affirmative consent and about whether that can deliver true, consistent justice. Say more about your concerns as it relates to affirmative consent. I, I think that first, you, th this can be a conversation you can have. You can talk about training. You can talk about showing kids hypotheticals. You can talk about dealing with toxic cultures. When it is then embodied in rules, and administrators have to determine what the lines of affirmative consent were, was it words or deeds? Then you wind up with essentially micromanaging sex. Now, interestingly enough, I don't have as much of a problem as others have about that on college campuses, because I think that college campuses should have civility rules. I have enormous problems about it when affirmative consent becomes a rule on the criminal side, because then you're really talking about all the ambiguities of affirmative consent get translated into liberty concerns. And, and, and by ambiguity, you mean we're we're both 18, it's late at night, it's 2 a.m., we both have been drinking, and did 
I consent to have sex? Did I consent right. just to kiss a little bit? What did I consent? Well, so you're, you're saying that, that that is a real gray area and you're nervous about mixing criminality with that. Right, I mean, it was great to move away from no, that where a woman had to say no, to understanding that sex should be a voluntary act. The question is how you enforce it. And the devil is really in the details. So you can't have a contract uh, before we get into bed. I'm sorry, you have to sign this. It is something that's gonna be contextual and the context puts college administrators in the position of regulating kids' sex. And that's where the rules begin to break down. So, so Leah, as someone who was a college student not that long ago, mm -hmm. what do you think about the idea of uh, affirmative consent actually being used mm -hmm. on, in a real world on a real basis? Or is it just a hopeful, idyllic dream and that's not really what happened when you were at Middlebury and elsewhere? I think it falls somewhere in the middle. I think as a woman on campus, my goal, whether idealistic or not, and I believe that as a society we ought to strive that it not be idealistic, is that both as men, women, and all genders, we strive for wanted, consensual, safe, and gratifying, important to talk about the sex actually being good and pleasurable, um, sex. So I think when we then translate that to the college campus, is it possible that we can do this under the influence of significant alcohol? Is it possible that we can have that under the influence of the myriad social pressures, be it Greek life or any other you know, subset of Greek life? I don't know. I'm skeptical, but I think it's possible. And so when I think about how we can move towards that reality, I'm a little bit concerned about the idea of literally of the goal of the regulation being we must ask at every step, you know, can I do this, can I do that, can I do that? I think it's assumed that to have safe and gratifying sex, we ought to be entirely in sync about what is permissible and not. Though, and I'm not, it's a, I'm putting myself in a complicated solution because I don't have like an explicit alternative solution and I do think that yes, as opposed to say, needing to say no is an absolute step forward both as a feminist and as a person on a college campus. That being said, it strikes me as fairly unrealistic and I, I, I'm worried about then how when we go into a case where we need to prove what happened, have we really you know, enabled ourselves to have any more proof than we had before? You know, when, when I look at confusing sexual cases on campuses right now, what they are trying to prove is was consent said or not. I don't know that saying you must say yes is going to change that reality, especially under the influence of significant and intoxication. Well, Can I well, respond a little bit? Please, please. I think that um, you know, you, you've raised very important issues and we cannot talk about sexual relationships on campus, sexual assault, so on, without including those other factors. Yeah. Once uh, you introduce alcohol, then you're right. I mean, judgment goes out in California law. If someone's intoxicated by law, by definition, they can't give consent. So that complicates all of this. For us, as college presidents, we have to do it all. We have to do alcohol education. We have to do relationship education, anti-discrimination, sexual assault education. So it, it's hard to pull one piece out and say, this will be the solution. Absolutely. Without all those other things, we don't have a solution. And Sean, do you, do you think, to that point, do you think that the bigger piece of the conversation may be more important than affirmative consent, or at least alongside it, is what you guys are or are not doing with regard to alcohol? In other words, should we be having as heated a conversation uh, about alcohol and whether it's allowed on campus and whether, in many cases, fraternities can serve it? Like, is, is that where the bulk of this conversation should come if we really want to dramatically decrease the amount? of sexual assault on campus, if not eliminated? You know, I think alcohol is part of the issue, but I certainly don't want us to put alcohol at the center of the, you know, one of the root causes. Uh, because I, you know, this comes back to, uh, to Leah's point, that you know, there's, some, there much, uh, there's some deeper root causes here about power dynamics, uh, about uh, the way um, you know, men and women see each other uh, that are really the core, uh, the core issues. And so you know, if, we, if we could eliminate alcohol on campus, would that eliminate issues around uh, sexual assault, sexual misconduct on campus? I think the answer to that is no. Um, that said, I think that education around alcohol, um, education about 
uh, healthy, what it means to have a broader sense of healthy lifestyle in all components. Uh, and that means uh, being able to enjoy oneself in a healthy way, to be able to engage in a healthy sexual relationship, uh, that that's really uh, an essential piece of it. So it's part of, the, it's part of the issue, but I certainly don't want to put that as the, center, as the centerpiece of any focus. Let's sort of make this focus this. On the one hand, talking about cultural change, that's terribly important, and it's actually something on which we all agree. But you also have to enforce ru disciplinary rules. So people are being kicked out of school for the enforcement of a standard whose boundaries are really quite ambiguous. Now, as I said, that, the enforcement of that standard in a criminal setting, I'm totally opposed to. So the, uh, I sat on the ad board at Harvard, and we were getting cases which you know, you can't at least, not, not the cases like the Brock Turner case, I mean, you're talking about all the cases in between, where essentially college administrators are being asked to come up with a sex code. And, and, and they're coming up with a sex code in disciplinary proceedings that are confidential. So you're coming up with a really ambiguous sex code because nobody knows what happened in those proceedings. So the issue is not the cultural and important educational issue. The issue is the enforcement of it and the difficulties of enforcement of it and what it does to your campus. I know that California requires it, so that's actually, uh, you have no choice. Well, right, I'm gonna jump in here just for a moment because at point taken, at this point, we usually do something that we love and that presidential candidates fear. We call it fact check. <laughs> and um, uh, and we yeah, take a moment to ask a couple of uh, tough but interesting questions of each side and uh, see how well prepared they are. So, um, you guys ready to participate? Yes. All right, here we go. All right. First fact check comes from a study that was just published a couple of weeks ago by researchers at North Carolina State. Now, a survey of male athletes, in fact, there were almost 400 participants um, at this large public university, uh, NCAA Division I. What percentage said they'd engage in coercive behavior with women? So what percentage of male athletes said they have engaged in coercive behavior with women? Self-reported. Uh, Self-reported in this particular instance. A is 18%, B is 42%, C is 54%. You guys, you guys can actually talk amongst yourselves no, for two seconds. You guys can talk amongst yourselves. I'm gonna give you about 30 seconds. Who's gonna give me the Jeopardy music while we wait for him? Anybody? Can we ask for a definition of course? Or is yeah. that not part of it? You cannot ask for, for that. This well, judge won't allow right, it, but you right. can brainstorm that. Can we ask for a landline, right. whatever it's called. I know, clarification on self-reporting? Who's self-reporting? <laughs> we're, we're talking about among yeah, these 379 uh, 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 people who were surveyed, how many of these 379 uh, Division I men said that they had been involved in coercive behavior uh, towards women? Was it 18%, 42%, or 54%? We have an answer. Yep. And by the way, Facebook family, you guys can vote too, sift.ly. You go ahead and cast your vote too. Uh, we're definitely in favor of uh, franchisement or the franchise here at uh, Point Taken. All right, here we go, beep, beep, beep. Uh, Leah, Nancy, what's 18? your, you guys say 18. Coming out of the box with 18. All right, where are you guys? We said 18. 18. 18, great minds think alike and wrong. Okay. <laughs> all right, optimist. all right. A lot of IQ went the wrong way here. Okay. The answer, in fact, believe it or not, and this was self reported, 54%. Wow. wow. Interesting study. Also, by the way, found that male athletes, whether they were intercollegiate or recreational um, college players, more likely to believe what they called rape myths, for example. If the woman is drunk or doesn't fight back, it's not really rape. Mm, that I believe. Very interesting. So obviously kind of frames part of the reason why we're having this conversation and, and the context, as you called it, the underlying culture here. All right, you guys ready for the next question? Sure. Mm -hmm. I hope so. <laughs> we can't do worse. So, <laughs> so, uh, so by the way, uh, uh, don't forget, uh, folks, go to sift.ly and vote. We already had some good folks do it on this first one. Uh, we see some of the results there. Um, and you can also go to WGBH as well. Our, and, and the code is WGBH. So uh, we were having fun getting this right. OK. <laughs> um, all right, the second question. Here's the second question. In one poll by the Kaiser Family Foundation, 57% of the public saw college sexual assault as a big problem, uh, so more than half. 
In a more recent poll by Kaiser in the Washington Post, what percentage of students said the same thing? A, about 50%. B, more than 75%. C, less than 20%. The question again, what percentage of students saw college sexual assault as a big problem in the Kaiser study? Do, 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 do. I guess someone else is supposed to do that. Okay. Um, you guys can go to um, uh, sift.ly and vote. Um, also, uh, visit us. Uh, use the code WGBH, uh, which, of course, stands for our sponsoring PBS station, WGBH in Boston. Okay, a lot more conversation on this one. Okay. Uh, with confidence, I'm going to go to our college presidents. Sean, Diane, what say you? We're saying more than 75% because they are victims of the press. It doesn't imply incidents, but rather they're seeing it as a big problem because they're reading about it. Oh, very interesting. College president indeed. OK. Uh, Nancy and Leah, what what's say you? <laughs> I'm conflicted between 50 and 20. Got to land. Let's just go for the 20. Go for the 20. Well, in fact, she is right. Oh. She is right. Uh, less than 20%. Do we win anything? <laughs> you do. You get to spend more time with me. <laughs> um, all right. Well, we have to win something good. Okay. Only 12% of student respondents viewed it as a big problem at their school. Wow. It complete, at their school. Not, uh, not what I would have expected. No. Uh, uh, interesting there. Um, okay. Um, this last one's a little bit of an unfair question uh, because I know at least one Great. person's going to know the answer to this. But in 1970, this school made the cover of Life Magazine. Anyone here remember Life Magazine? A few people? A few? Uh, uh, Life Magazine for being the first in America to institute co-ed dorms. Which school was it? Was it A, Oberlin, B, UCLA, C, Brown? Was it A, Oberlin, B, UCLA, C, Brown? Um, which college was on the cover of Life magazine as the first to institute co-ed dorms? Berkeley is up there. You know we're going to we're going to use the broad University of California umbrella. Nice catch, though. Nice catch. We're going to use the broad. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Go Bears! Number one pick in the NFL draft this year. Um, Oberlin. Uh, you guys say Oberlin. Oberlin. Are you sure? Yes. Okay. What say you? Uh, this one I really have to get, Oberlin. <laughs> yeah, this was unfair because Sean spent good time as a dean at Oberlin. In fact, <laughs> the, 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 the oh, answer, the softball I did, I did, I did, I did a little, uh, little softball yes. there. Um, all right, so we want to uh, continue the conversation a little bit. Before we jump back, though, into our discussion, at Point Taken, we usually have a wonderful poll from our friends at Marist. Uh, this time around, we decided to uh, utilize a terrific Gallup poll. A um, couple interesting things from a 2015 Gallup poll from uh, Inside Higher Ed. Now, not surprisingly, the survey found that 32%, about a third of respondents, agree or strongly agree that sexual assault is prevalent at American colleges and universities. But what surprised me and may surprise you too, respondents were asked the same question about their own institution. So not just is it, a, is it an overall problem, but what's going on in my backyard. In that case, only 6% agree or strongly agree uh, that sexual assault is prevalent on their own campuses. So, um, so interesting uh, in that regard. Uh, Diane and Sean, let me turn to you. Uh, whether the answer is 6%, as people said about their own campus, or 32%, as they thought about broadly, um, what do you think, in addition to affirmative consent, are some of the key things that need to happen to dramatically turn the tide on this question over the next decade? Maybe if I can begin, and I, I want to sort of circle back to, to something that, that Nancy just said a little while ago. You know, there are there are real challenges on the adjudication of these cases on college campuses. And you know, we, I think campuses face the, the dual mandate to make sure that we, we treat uh, both sides fairly uh, in any process. Um, but then campuses also have the responsibility to be uh, places of support and education for the students at the same time. And those are two very difficult things to balance. Um, Sean, I think, I'm, I'm sorry, I know what you mean by that. Um, uh, but they may not because they may not have been in the middle of these cases. Yeah. Be even more plain. What do you mean that it's hard to separate it, that, that it's ambiguous? Be even clearer for the audience here mm -hmm. about what you actually tend to face at Kenyon, mm -hmm. at Oberlin, at other schools. Well, I think that we, 
you know, we wear simultaneously the hat of wanting to you know, educate our students and a real mandate to educate our students in terms of uh, both healthy behavior and civil behavior and what makes a, uh, a good, not only campus culture, but what's good behavior to go on after graduation. Um, at the same time, as Nancy mentioned, uh, we have the responsibility uh, when something does happen on campus to adjudicate and to uh, go into you know, find someone either responsible or not responsible in violation of, uh, of the campus rules. You know, I think that the most of our emphasis, and you know, this is where the notion of affirmative consent has to fit into a larger context, really has to be on that education piece. Uh, because you know, really once we get to a point where there's an incident that's happened or a report that's happened and we get to the adjudication point, there really has already been a failure you know, and it's incredibly difficult and ambiguous to get at the, that in particular instant, the incident. Uh, what's really most important is for us to have a, a holistic view of uh, how we address the root causes that we've been talking about, how we make sure that, you know, those male students that you were talking about in the survey who respond that uh, if someone is unresponsive, then that's okay, that they understand the definition that no consent actually has to be clear, knowing, and freely given, uh, that those are all, that education point up front is the piece that I think is absolutely essential. Uh, Leah and Nancy, sound like you guys are about to jump in on this. Um, I think that we're in agreement, actually. I don't know if this makes for such a good debate. <laughs> yeah. we, 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 you, know, you know what we say? Okay. We, we say point taken. I mean, you took this point, that's good. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, so I view the responsibility, at least when I agreed to go to a private college, I viewed their responsibility to prevent instances of assault or other sort of damage to occur, to respond adequately and to resolve it promptly and adequately. And I think that we're on the same page that we wouldn't need to talk about responding and resolving if there wasn't, you know, if our culture was perfect and there wasn't any sort of underlying factors that enabled the situations to surface in the first place. So I think that you know, and it, it goes vice versa, that if we want to completely and dis, like, disable ourselves from even needing to respond, we need to have the preventative measures, and I view education as foundational to those preventative measures. Talk for a minute about hookup culture and the extent to which you think that plays a role um, uh, uh, in, mm -hmm. in these instances and maybe even makes it hard yeah. or harder in some cases yeah. to adjudicate this. Uh, right. Uh, consistently, fairly, properly. So when I speak about the influence of hookup culture on rape culture, potential influence, I find it extremely important to clarify that this does not apply to all instances of rape, especially in the in context of Brock Turner's assault, which is, in my opinion, a clear, crystal clear violation of every sort of social norm. It has nothing to do with the influence of hookup culture on him. It has everything to do with sociopathic behavior that is completely non-permissible, and that's much just my personal opinion. Um, but when it comes to, you know, at large, I spent four years on a campus where people were freely having casual sex on a very frequent basis, um, and I have both personally experienced and interviewed hundreds of women who have experienced the confusion that comes along with blurred lines. Um, when we are engaging sexually in a culture that by nature is supposed to be emotionless and meaningless and um, non-communicative, it's supposed to be, you know, like that, that sex, and this is not to say that all students engage in this, many students don't, and I don't think it, it's hard to talk about this without generalizing, but when we are engaging in a type of sex that is supposed to be non-communicative and solely physical and gratifying for the sake of the physical activity and not for the emotional connection, um, it, we set ourselves up for these very confusing situations in which afterwards, many women are left questioning, was this really just really bad sex? Did he trespass upon my boundaries? Often it's just I, the day after regret. How does that day after regret then translate for some people? It's just, it's a very difficult conversation to have because it's crucially important to not blame victims and not um, you know, mitigate the damage done by assault. Uh, but I think that when 
students are just freely engaging in these uh, casual sexual norms without thinking critically. It's not to say all don't, but many students not thinking critically about the behavior and the potential emotional impact that that might have on them after the next day, seeing that student in the dining hall. Um, you know, it's just difficult. We set ourselves up to be in very confusing and potentially damaging situations. Mm -hmm. Nancy, what did you think when you saw the uh, Brock Turner case? Well, uh, that's, uh, uh, in one sense, it's not remotely complicated. I cannot think of a single circumstance under which uh, there was anything remotely like consent or anything like a voluntary act to, uh, you know, sex with an unconscious woman behind a dumpster. You know what I mean? That we, this is, that's sort of so far out of this discussion that we're having. But the legal rules mattered in the sense that this conversation became a conversation about what the rules should be on campus and what the procedure should be. And there's no question that we and college campuses have had a hard time figuring out what the balance is that you were talking about. You know, uh, I came from a, from a university, Harvard law professors objected to Harvard University's procedures, which were essentially, you come in and complain and the odds are whatever you said we'll accept. I mean, it was essentially a processless procedure, a due processless procedure. And then when you add to that def de broad definitions of affirmative consent, you do not have a fair procedure. So we have to separate out, as I think this conversation is doing, the fits and starts and difficulties of dealing with coming up with the appropriate rules and the appropriate procedures and the wider discussion. Turner is not part of that wider discussion because there is nothing about that case that is nuanced or ambiguous in my judgment talk, at all. Talk to me about the judge. What did you think about what, what the judge, you're mm. a former judge yourself. Talk to me about the judge. This is not in the script. But this is not in the script. Yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah, no. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I think it's interesting. I mean, uh, uh, I sentenced many people over the course of my career. I, I actually thought that this was an extraordinarily lenient sentence. I was actually very surprised. I do think, though, we have to separate out the, what he did, the, the mistake that the judge may have made in this case, which I think is clear, versus the recall petition, which I think is outrageous. And the reason why I think the recall petition is outrageous is that judges are only criticized when they are lenient. They are never criticized when they are off the wall harsh. Mm -hmm. And if you really want to enforce m meaningful judicial temperament, mm -hmm you have to be dealing with both sides of this. So it seems to me we criticize this judge and we can criticize him mightily, but the question of whether he, he should be recalled is another question. <coughs> the whole patchwork quilt of our criminal law has to be examined. Yes. Owen Lerbree in St. Paul School, this is the kid who was part of the culture at St. Paul and had sex with a young woman, he gets two years because that sexual encounter was initiated by a computer and they had a statute that said, you know, c computer sex is a two-year mandatory minimum. Um, and the structure of the Brock Turner case was so totally different. So that's why I, this conversation, when you map it onto the criminal law, has to stop and be very cautious about what the rules are and liberty and those issues. Can but, I just add please. there, because, you know, with all of our requirements, and I brought this, I don't know if you can see it, this is our 30-page required, it includes federal, state, and campus policies related to victim rights. Very legalistic, but we have to do this. So we're, on the one hand, being forced to adjudicate these kinds of cases and situations. When we do it at our best, when we have a case that is clear-cut, and we refer it to the district attorney, and they say, no, that's not a slam dunk, we're not gonna file charges. We okay. have that over and over, so I agree with you that the criminal justice system is broken with regard to sexual assault and other related actions. Well, it's broken in both respects. So there are the yes. DAs who turn you down if the case is even remotely ambiguous, and many are not. Yep. And then there is the history of racism yes. in the criminal justice system, particularly with respect to rape cases. So yes. that's why it's really important to separate out criminal campus procedures and the cultural discussion which we have to have. Jean, what, do you, what experience do you have uh, as you think about class and race issues and how those have played into uh, discussions and adjudications of, mm -hmm. uh, of sexual assault, either at Mount Holyoke where you were for a decade or at uh, Oberlin or, or now at Kenyon. You know, and, and without dwelling on any specifics, I think that the, you know, it's clear that 
uh, there are a wide range of inequities in our society and on our college campuses. And some of those are on gender, some of those are on uh, sexuality and gender identity, but they are also inequities on issues of race, issues of class. Um, those actually connect a lot to uh, the, the social capital and the ability of some students to navigate through the system, uh, either as a claimant or a respondent. Um, and you know, that certainly plays a role in how these, you know, these cases unfold when they're adjudicated on campus. Um, you know, class especially plays a role in terms of the resources that students may have to bring to bear and the support systems that students may have to, to bring to bear. You know, we do have uh, now the, you know, the case law that governs adjudication of these uh, cases on campuses does say that um, students can bring in the advisor of their choice and that advisor can be an attorney. Um, you know, the attorney doesn't function as a counsel for uh, the student in a process, but certainly I think students who are able to have the resources to bring in a legal counsel to navigate through a system are at a very different position than students who don't have those resources. Um, you know, and I think those are just added layers here that, uh, that make all of these ambiguities uh, just even more complex to, to navigate. And I think that there are also things around the, the education components that we need to think about here that um, you know, if one of the root causes behind uh, sexual assault on campuses are uh, failures of some students to see other students as full human citizens of that campus or the broader society and to sort of have a respect and empathy for uh, the rights and position of that person. Uh, that's something that is deeply connected to inequities on gender. It's also, I think, at the same time, deeply connected to issues around race and class and other things as well. And that, you know, that core concept of how do we instill a sense of the value of respect and empathy for all people at all times, you know, that that in a sense, I think it's the core of our mission as an undergraduate institution that, you know, that we should hope that all of our students graduate with that. Uh, at the same time, I think when that fails, we do see you know, very bad things happening, and that includes uh, sexual assault. You guys, I want to take you to so one uh, last topic, which is a number of the researchers who've looked at this matter have said that um, for young women and for young men on college campus, uh, part of what's been impactful uh, here have been um, increased access to porn. Um, and changes in our music, uh, well, which, which have, have shaped the way we think about sex and consent um, and those sorts of things. Any thoughts on that, uh, Leah, uh, that you want to share? Do you, do you think that is relevant to, uh, to this epidemic of sexual assault they're hearing, or does that feel like something that is, is, is separate and apart? So there are studies and arguments that go both ways. There are people that say, there are studies that say that porn increases men, especially inexperienced sexual men's susceptibility to um, attempting to perform potentially aggressive sexual acts. I think that is definitely a reality, though there are also studies that say um, access to porn results in decreased aggressiveness sexually. Um, so I'm not going to approach it so much on like the statistic level, because I think that the argument can be made both ways. However, I do think that for me, the role of pornography on, in sex on campus is just another relational point to the lack of sec sufficient sexual education in this country, be it from um, secondary schools, elementary schools, parents, um, religious institutions, whatever it may be, um, that leads students, uh, that as they are not in many other countries, for example, um, in the Netherlands, where they have a very advanced and progressive sexual curriculum, leads inexperienced students who are obviously are young people, not even students who are eager to learn about sex, that's a human drive, to turn to pornography. Um, not all, porn, some pornography is fantastically liberal. Much of mainstream pornography is very male-centric and represents sex that many women, and not all, but many women would perceive to be abusive and transgressive of their boundaries. Um, I think that that then translates when those students who are susceptible to that porn and watch it frequently and are not receiving subsequent education about what pleasurable sex looks like, what consent looks like, um, what sexual communication looks like, it results in them attempting to perform what they view to be normative. I don't know that that's a direct causal, causal effect, though I can personally attest to having been in sexual experiences that felt performatively pornographic, where I had to stop and say, this is 
ridiculous. It's like you can, it's just terrible, you know? And like many women um, that I've interviewed report the same thing and it might seem, you know, like explicit to say that, but I think we need to start having this conversation and start talking about not only is there abusive sex happening, but there's also just a lot of really bad sex happening and that's not just uh, unfortunate, it represents a lot of difficult systematic and institutional flaws in this country. Uh, Nancy and Diane, I'm gonna give you guys a final word here before we go to some more voting in the audience. Nancy, what have we not talked about today that you think we should talk about on this topic? Well, I, I think that we've, we've talked at a level of generality. I mean, part of, the, part of what Lee and I talked about before we got on here was that, so you have a culture, a hookup culture, a culture of, of uh, casual sex in the context of a world of gender inequality. You know, I mean, uh, uh, when, I, when I was a young woman, we knew we were unequal. There was no illusion about it. And there's a funny way in which young women today believe, uh, uh, are, uh, believe somehow that, that, that they've almost gotten the message, everyone has gotten the message, and obviously that is not true. But the best measure of what Leah was just talking about, of course, was the comment of Brock Turner's father. Mm. What was it? Numbers of years yes. for 20 minutes of action? Yes. This was, this was the embodiment of the kind of pornographic themes that Leah is talking about. And the notion that he felt comfortable saying that out loud in a courtroom to justify a lesser sentence says something about the depth of these attitudes. Yes. Diane, what else have we not talked about today that you think we should have uh, brought up in regard to this topic? There's so much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, w one issue I think that complicates all of this even more that we sort of alluded to, but really we need to take on is the, the need for uh, the, tr the identity transsexualism so that you, when, when individuals, you're talking about um, gender identity, sexual orientation, you're talking about race, you're talking about all different forms of identity that someone has and then superimposing sexual behavior on it makes it all that more complicated and begs the question for the responsibility that we have as leaders on campuses of trying to educate all of our students, not just the Greeks, not just the, the band members or the athletes, but all of our students about healthy sexuality and healthy not communication. Just the heterosexual students. And not, that's what I said, yeah. yes. Um, all right, we are going to go to the vote. So you guys voted before, and let's see if we can pull up the numbers and see where you came out. And you good folks in uh, our Facebook family also voted as well. So we asked, can college be managed by a checklist or what we're calling affirmative consent? And, um, mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I'm waiting to see if we're going to get to see what the numbers were back then. So we had, oh, very interesting. Oh, uh, all right, so you guys, are, are people voting again, or am I seeing the old numbers? These are new votes. I love this. New votes, fresh votes, we believe. Um, no, no, no. Let's go Chicago. Vote, vote early, vote often. All right. Um, sorry. So, uh, uh, so cast your votes right now. Can college be managed by a checklist? Now, remember, Facebook family, you guys can go to sift.ly, S-I-F-T dot L-Y. The code is WGBH, which, of course, stands for our sponsoring PBS station, WGBH, so S-I-F-T dot L-Y. Um, please uh, go and vote, um, code WGBH. Um, so uh, prior to the conversation here, the vote was? <laughs> we had 24% who voted yes originally. 47% no. And 29 not sure. Now, after a spirited conversation, um, so we're going to still give you a little more time to vote. <laughs> How do you like that? We're leaving yes. the polls open. We saw what happened with Brexit, and we're worried. So, so we're leaving more time to vote for all the good people. Um, um, but at Point Taken, one of the things that we love to do, we believe that debate should and could be healthy vigorous, uh, pointed, but that it also can uh, be civil. And so we like to see what we learned from the other side. So why don't I start over here uh, and ask the chemist and the social worker what they learned uh, today uh, from the other side. What was the most interesting point you heard from Leah and Nancy? And then I'm going to ask uh, Leah and Nancy what they learned. I, I, I'm going to jump in. Um, 
I, I really appreciated your commenting about the need for improvement in the criminal justice system related to these topics because we are living that uh, every day. And uh, to have a law professor and former judge agree with that makes me feel better. Yeah. Well, and I, I think uh, as well the, um, you know, Leah, your point on the importance of positive sexual education, you know, for all students and actually reaching back further before college is just an integral part of what's needed uh, for, for young people across the board, I think, is, is a point well taken. Um, Leah, what, uh, what, if anything, was the most compelling, most interesting uh, point that you heard from, uh, from Diane and Sean? I think, um, I'm not, not so sure that this is a point so much as just an expression of appreciation uh, as a former student that you are fully aware of the complexities of the cultural dynamics on your campus, yet you are actively taking steps in the right direction under the awareness that these steps might not perfectly encompass the resolution of this issue, but that they are more positive than what existed before, and that you are actively working in that direction as a former student implicated by the sexual culture. I say thank you to that. And Nancy, uh, uh, you, uh, I know you had some strong thoughts here, but what points did they make that you thought were most compelling and well, most I, interesting? I thought that what was, what was really interesting is that this conversation, in, maybe it's just because I'm a lawyer, invariably slides into discussions about rules and procedures. And, what, and your, your conversation makes it clear that that really is not where this is at at all and that it is not about rules are bound to be under-inclusive, procedures are bound to be unfair in some situations, and what we really ought to be talking about is the culture. And I thought that that was enormously helpful. Um, uh, Facebook family, we're gonna now give you the votes and give all the good folks here the votes. So the first vote, uh, just to refresh you again, before the conversation, 24%, about a quarter of you, uh, said yes, um, college sex can be managed by a checklist. Uh, almost half of you, 47%, said yet, don't believe it. And about 29% of you were not sure, were on the fence. Uh, but here comes the second vote. Um, uh, the yeses stayed roughly the same, 21%, so 24 down to 21. But the noes surged, uh, 65% uh, now are, uh, are uh, siding up with the judge and the writer and 15% are not sure. So a very interesting um, uh, change uh, there across the board. Um, we are gonna continue this conversa point taking conversation with our wonderful audience here. I think we're gonna take a few minutes now to ask some of you what you thought. And I wonder if we have, we do, we have a magic microphone uh, right there. In fact, we have two of them because it's twice as nice. It's great. And so I would love to hear from a couple of you about either questions or concerns that you had as you heard this uh, discussion and debate unfold. I think we had a poll. The poll said that something like 80% 80, 80 of undergraduates didn't think that this sexual assault was a real grave problem on their campuses. Um, so I don't, I'm not asking this in a flippant way. So if these are the people who are involved, why do they, and, and this is such a great problem, why do they think otherwise? I mean, why, why, why don't they appreciate the gravity of the situation? Dan, Sean, you guys want to take a first uh, sw <laughs> swing at that? I mean, you're in the heart of it. We're talking about your students. I think if it hasn't happened to an individual or someone they know, they can uh, blow it off, that it's not a big problem. If it hasn't been in the press in a big way on a campus and really on their radar, they might think it's not a big problem. Leah, Lee, do you have a guess as to, why, uh, as to why that is? I mean, to me, this resonates. I completely agree with you. But I think, you know, most controversial. You, if you poll Americans, do you think that racism is alive and well in this country? I think the vast majority will say no. That's completely false. Racism is still alive and well in this country. That is my personal belief, and I believe it's substantiated by fact and occurrence. That being said, it, it's all about proximity. You know, um, However proximate you are to an issue, you're susceptible to believe that your experience is reality. Um, and I think also we're facing a massive phenomenon uh, that the vast, not perhaps not the vast majority, majority, but a large majority of rapes are not um, presented to the administration. Many people suffer in silence, and as with many other cultural phenomena. And maybe, and just as one thing, building on that last point, I think we have 
a broader cultural challenge you know, beyond college campuses still uh, to recognize uh, sexual assault and rape as an issue. You know, that um, you know, we still exist in a, you know, the framework or the context of a larger culture that makes the assumption that uh, maybe it's the victim's fault, right? Or that there isn't something that's larger about a, um, something that's systematic or problematic um, uh, that exists. And so, you know, in some ways that doesn't surprise me in that I think if you pulled uh, more broadly, not just restricted to college campuses, but you know, what are the uh, issues around uh, rape and is rape a serious issue in this country? You might see a similar. Well, I, let me, similar let me make a lawyer point for a moment. I mean, part of it is also definitional. I can exactly. see the people who are responding to that says, "Well, no, gee, I never participate in rape. I'm not a rapist." And of course, their definition of what is uh, voluntary sex may be very different. So these polls need to. We need to understand what the respondents are thinking about in, with that term, how that term is resonating. What's really interesting in, in com to complement that is the percentage of almost 50% of men involved in athletic, um, when asked, have you, what was it, have you like trespassed on people's boundaries Coercive. or something? Coercive. Coercive, 50% said yes, yet I bet <laughs> when presented with, did you rape somebody? They say no. Like right. maybe five would say yes. Right, so I mean, it's really, a, a part of the yes. complication is the complication of the definitions here. Question there. So my worry is that you, uh, the uh, college presidents, still have they're mandated by law to uh, protect uh, women against rape or everyone against rape. Uh, so, what is the best way of going about that? Uh, since it is a problem that's nebulous and people are drunk and so on. It, it seems like the best thing to do is just get a verbal consent. Nancy, so if we asked you to succeed Drew Faust at, uh, uh -huh. at Harvard, what, right. would you, what would you do? Well, the problem with, you asked a lot of things in that one question. Um, so one answer to that was we're asking college campuses to remedy societal problems. And if they're not doing a fabulous job at it all the time, it's because they, the, the, the roots of that problem really go deep. That's one thing. And then the, the other side of the coin is a, a rule of affirmative consent that says you have to get a yes is an illusion, in my view. That's not the way sex happens. What will happen is the, the, if it's a man who's being accused, he'll say, well, she said yes. Right? I mean, so it's really... We, we, we have to enforce the disciplinary rules, but that's not necessarily the best way to do it. It really gets back to the larger discussion here. Disciplinary proceedings are, are essential, there's no question about it, but the, the prior question is what are we teaching kids on campus, how are we teaching it, and then well, how, what's the society teaching kids on campus? You know, you really... Uh, it, I do a lot of work in criminal justice issues. That's sort of my specialty. And the criminal justice system becomes the dumping ground for all social welfare, all that issues. In one sense, we're asking colleges to go back to where they were when I went to school, which is parents patriae, which is to right. be substitute parents. Um, only being substitute parents in 2016 is incredibly complicated. I know this now that my kids are way into their 20s. This is a good thing not to be their parent anymore. <laughs> Uh, let me ask a uh, maybe follow-up question to that, uh, and we touched on it earlier, but given that we know alcohol is at least part of the problem, even if we all agree that there are multiple parts of it, and that's one of these, why are college campuses not much more strict uh, about alcohol consumption? Hmm. Well, th there's different views about how do you uh, educate and, and prepare students to not binge drink, there are those that think if we teach responsible drinking, that actually leads to less binge drinking. There are those who think, no, take it away, don't have anything around there, don't even talk about it, prohibit it, go back to prohibition practically. I personally believe on a college campus that isn't the best way to do it. Um, and so it's a, you know, there, there are a lot of philosophical disagreements in this country about what we do with alcohol, and, and especially on college campuses. There are, there are many college campuses that serve alcohol to those 21 and over on their campus. Other campuses, it's totally dry, wouldn't even think about it. But what we know is when 
when students are not able to get to any alcohol, they go off campus and find the alcohol. So it depends on where you want to deal with the problem. But it, but it, is, a, it is a discussion that goes to what are the root causes here? Is it the fraternity system? Is it the culture of sports teams? Is it alcohol? Uh, you know, what, what are the sort of institutional things that make this more likely, which is where we need to be looking? And, and I think actually, you know, on alcohol, um, actually, I don't think it's a root cause, right? Because I think the root cause are these, these deeper cultural fundamental pieces. Um, at the same time, I know at least on a, a climate study that we did on our campus, it was about two-thirds of uh, students, uh, both uh, claimants and respondents, um, on, uh, you know, who are self-reporting, experiencing, or being involved in a uh, case of sexual misconduct uh, said alcohol was involved. You know? So I think uh, we don't necessarily need to treat alcohol as a, you know, as a root cause and as the sense that if we solve the alcohol problem, we solve uh, the larger issue. Uh, but at the same time, it's clearly tightly correlated. You know, and Absolutely. that if we can get at, uh, you know, if our larger goal is prevention, uh, we actually have to think about what are the things we can do that um, attack this from the strongly correlated pieces. Uh, and I think alcohol is one of them. To come back, I, I agree strongly with what uh, Diane was saying. I think colleges are in this difficult position of you know, the law is the law on drinking age. You know, so the drinking right. age is 21. Uh, you know, I firmly state that as an institution, we follow the law in terms of the, uh, enforcing the drinking age on campus. That said, I think we miss out on a valuable opportunity to teach responsible alcohol consumption because you know, we're not allowed to say uh, or to model or to give a context for what it means to responsibly drink alcohol. Uh, and if we think that just because we say that you're not allowed to drink on campus, that that means that um, students are not drinking, we're just kidding ourselves. You know? And the further you try to push it, the more underground it goes and the more dangerous it becomes. And so that's a real challenge for institutions. Final question here. As researchers have tried to wrap their minds around the different statistics that inform this conversation, um, the true rate of rape and sexual assault, uh, the rate of underreporting, the rate of false accusations, all of these things, um, there have been studies done on campus, there have been studies done off campus. I wonder how much, as you guys try to understand this problem, you think um, it's possible to extrapolate from one to the other. In other words, is the is the phenomenon on campus so different from off campus that you can't look to studies done off campus to understand it? And also, can you look at studies done on one campus and you know, compare it to a different institution? So is Duke, Middlebury, and Notre Dame, say, similar enough that it tells us something? So I guess, uh, overall, how much we, can we extrapolate from studies done in one context or place to other places? I'd love to answer that. I just had this long dialogue with one of our sociology faculty who was in charge of our campus climate survey where we were looking at incidents. He did a meta-analysis of all of the universities that have done prevalence studies. So we hear the one in five students on US campuses have been raped or sexually assaulted. That statistic is being shot through and through by other studies that keep coming out. The faculty member said to me, here's what I've determined from his meta-analysis. The smaller the response rate on a survey, on a campus, doesn't matter which campus, Kentucky, Stanford, Vanderbilt, Texas, doesn't matter, the larger the incidents they're gonna report. For campuses that had a 100% response rate, they're gonna have a lower incidence. We had a very high response rate, and we had a lower incidence, and it's really interesting. So it's all about definition. Why, why is that? Why it's it about difference? definition. It's about uh, how people define and, and use the terms. It's also about when you don't have a, a large response rate, the tendency is for those who have been victims to respond. They're going to respond more so than those who have not been victims. But if you get 100% of your sample, your population, then you're going to get a, a truer reading of what the incident says. But it's another example of where the, the, the statistics are less important. I mean, How you define it, it. It, even if it's one in 25, right? I mean, it, we should do something about it. So we focus on the statistics as a way of justifying action or inaction, and it shouldn't be. 
Uh, we have actually one last uh, bonus question. Oh. Uh, my name's Dan Porterfield. I'm the president of Franklin and Marshall College. Um, liberal Arts College is very much like Oberlin. And um, this is a fantastic, I'm sorry, like Kenyon, <laughs> a fantastic conversation. I would love to see you, Carlos, take this to campuses. You could have hundreds and hundreds of kids and faculty, staff, mm -hmm. um, not only discussing these topics, but just the, mo the model for, for you know, real discussion. It's fantastic. I, I, I actually think that's a terrific idea. And uh, at the risk of getting in trouble with John and uh, Denise and Sheila and, uh, <laughs> uh, and the rest of the uh, hardworking crew, yeah, I hope I, we do it. That's I a smart idea. I, I want to host you. Well, we'll start in yeah. Pennsylvania. Yeah. I like that. All right. <laughs> but, uh, but I do think there was a little bit of a bias built into the question. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Because the question was, <laughs> yes. can college sex be regulated with by a check, a check by a checklist? <laughs> well, obviously, the answer to that is no. And Leah, your answer was majestic when you talked about hookup culture. That's exactly why you can't regulate college sex with a checklist. But we have to address a different question. The question is, can we develop a system to fairly adjudicate sexual misconduct? And there, the notion of affirmative consent still seems to me to have merit. Mm -hmm. Students have to give consent. Not just once, not yesterday, but with each sexual act and reasonably with gradations of sexual activity. That seems like a fair rule. It doesn't seem to me to be, I mean, maybe in some cases it's hard to tell, of course. But is the answer to this, we're gonna regulate sexual misconduct with no rules? I, I don't see how that will work. So, so that I, I do think ultimately, I do think that the presidents won the debate. Because they, they have to, <laughs> we, because, I because, love right, it. because we, have to, we have to run a system that adjudicates mm -hmm. sexual misconduct. We're not trying to regulate sex. We're trying to, to teach students, but also hold them accountable for sexual misconduct. Uh, Diane, Sean, I assume you disagree with him. <laughs> well, well, well said. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, Nancy, what's, what say well, you to the, that? The, the, when you added the loosening of the procedures for adjudicating sexual misconduct with affirmative consent, you wind up with a system that could border on the unfair to those who are accused. Uh, because the burden is completely on him to somehow say in this uh, situation that there was uh, affirmative consent. So that the problem is the combination of the procedural rules which vary around uh, uh, around the country that were loosened and affirmative consent. Then on the point about whether you're regulating sex, of course you are. You sit on these cases and you're identifying what is appropriate sex and what is misconduct. And so to some degree, you are, you are in fact, e even if it's not an a priori, a before checklist, you're doing it afterwards. And the notion that college, colleges are better at that than uh, judges or lawyers is, uh, you know, an open question, an open question. We had some very naughty cases when I was um, on the administrative board at Harvard. And, um, you know, when you are regulating sex, and you're regulating sex oftentimes by people of one generation regulating sex of kids from another, um, it's, it, it, it has to be done because there has to be some disciplinary structure. But I really think that it has to be, that the, we have to look at the procedures. And I'm open to affirmative consent in that setting, as I said before. But that can't be where the action is. The action is where you all were talking. Leah, we're going to give you the final word of mm -hmm. the entire, uh, entire set. <laughs> oh my gosh. Can we allow him to finish what he was going to say? Oh, well, did he have more? Yeah. Ultimately, your, your issue then is with the federal government. Yes. <laughs> because the colleges are complying with not affirmative consent. The federal government is not requiring affirmative the, consent. California is. The, the well, colleges. The, the, but, but but yes. But you states. said your problem was with the procedures. Right. But you also just said you weren't didn't have as much of a problem with affirmative consent as long as the procedures were not so loose that affirmative consent would somehow be used to take away the fairness right. for the, the accused. Right. The, for the most part, the Title IX, the Office of Civil Rights, required preponderance of the evidence, right. which is the lesser standard. But all the other questions about representation of counsel, uh, whether there is an independent adjudicator, or whether it's someone from the Title IX office, different universities have done different things. The de minimis was 
uh, uh, preponderance of the evidence. So there really is a range of procedures, some of which are quite fair, some of which are not. So, uh, I mean, I think that I'm in agreement with you that the question of will affirmative consent manage sex on campus, I think we're all in agreement that that is not a solution. It's a step. It's not a solution. It would definitely not entirely manage it, though I think that when we talk about Title IX and we talk about the fact that Title IX, basically it guarantees women an equal right to educational opportunities on campus, that to then say that I am not in favor of consent enables us to then like by the correlative property say that I am in favor, I am okay with people having sex that is non-consensual, which is a potentially indirect violation of a woman's opportunity to educational safety and freedom. So I think that we're all in agreement that can, at least I'm in agreement with you that consent is necessary and affirmative consent is a step forward, though I think we are all also in some sort of an agreement that we're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place on how we go about administering that procedurally. <laughs> I'm we're certainly gonna, not the one that would write those procedures. We're going to leave it here until <laughs> next year. Um, uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you for four wonderful, wonderful panels. Big hand, please, for, uh, for our panelists. Thank you. All right. Uh, I hope you guys uh, tune in to Point Taken this fall on PBS, 11 o'clock, Tuesday nights. <laughs>